Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for joining at a very short notice. Uh, we have we are pleased that several of you are joining live. Uh, this is our first uh, uh, online open house session on balloon volunteering. Uh, we would be recording this, recording this, and uh, putting it up on our blog uh, so that others can watch it uh, later. So why are we doing this? We are doing this because uh, you know there are many many requests for becoming a volunteer with iSpirit, and we are trying to streamline that process. Uh, so this session will tell you a little bit about balloon volunteering. What is volunteering? What is balloon volunteering? Where can you volunteer? Uh, uh, Sid uh, Sid Shetty, who is also on the call, uh, and a power volunteer uh, with iSpirit. Both of us will be walking through uh, a set of slides here. So let's get started without any delay. Uh, we are expecting that uh, many of you already know uh, what, uh, uh, what iSpirit is. Uh, this is really meant for those who are already familiar with iSpirit. So, <clears throat> so we're not going to go into a whole lot of detail about why iSpirit and, and, and what is iSpirit. Suffice to say that iSpirit is a non-profit technology think tank. And uh, we are not just a think tank, we are a think and do tank. And we drive uh, these longer term orbit shifts. Uh, we are about bringing about change here in India to solve hard societal problems. And as we undertake them, we believe these problems usually take 20 years to solve, uh, it, you know, any problem that you're looking at takes that long. And so we take, we have a long view on these problems. And uh, so we work with people who, who also are looking at these problems with a 10 year time frame. These are uh, either VCs, uh, if they're in the investment space or policymakers. And, uh, but it is uh, our belief that the real people who make change happen are the doers. These are incumbents or challengers. These are usually market players who are already operating the market and uh, they're incumbents and challengers. And if they are you know, open to change, they are very excited about the change, then they often are challengers. If they're somewhat hesitant about the change, then they are incumbents we work with, both of them. Our, our central belief is that to solve India's hard societal problems, you need innovation. And that innovation comes from private players who leverage digital public infrastructure to make it happen. So this is a Jugal Bandi type of an innovation uh, architecture. Uh, Jugal Bandi between private innovators and public infrastructure. And, uh, and all of this happens, you know, in an ecosystem, we tend to call the ecosystem a playground. So you will hear this word playground a couple of times today. So, so that's really what it is. Unlike uh, the doers who usually are doing it because it's a market activity, you know, and there is, there is value being created and they're monetizing that value. Uh, policymakers are doing it because that's a job. VCs are doing it to make money. We are different from all of these. We see ourselves as no greed, no glory volunteers. And, uh, and so we are doing it as nation building. And this is our contribution uh, to the nation. Now, if you step away from what iSpirit does, <clears throat> uh, this kind of thinking about taking a 20 year view on the problem uh, is not new. It happens in the Western world uh, quite, uh, you know, quite regularly. And uh, it is this kind of a view or the architects for taking this kind of this kind of a this 30 year architects, 20 year architects to solve that problem. They are either think tanks, uh, you know, iSpirit is a think tank. Another example of a think tank that does this is Bill and, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is looking, let's say, as look, looking at malaria as a 20 year kind of a problem. Very often there are universities, uh, Carnegie Mellon has done that with driverless cars, for example. And of course, there are research labs, you know, they were yeah, in the past, there used to be research labs like Bell Labs, but you have the Santa Fe lab, you have many other labs that are focused on something like this. So this is a quick introduction about iSpirit. So the question is, if you're an, if you're a, why should somebody actually do no greed, no glory volunteer, right? Uh, you know, what's in it for them and, uh, you know, what kind of compels them 
uh, to become a volunteer. And usually it's the mission. You know, people like to solve this kind of a societal problem, right? And there's something in them which attracts them uh, to that problem. And, and therefore the mission makes it happen. Uh, the second reason very often is the team. Uh, iSpirit generally at any time uh, has about 100 or so uh, volunteers and uh, active volunteers. We don't want to increase that number. The number will remain more or less uh, you know, at this number because we want to stay below the Dunbar limit. Uh, that way you know, there is kind of social trust within the team. It's easier for us to enforce our ethics and so on and so forth. Uh, so we want to stay small. And so it's really, really hard to become a volunteer, frankly. It's very hard to become a volunteer. And uh, on the flip side, you know, there is joy in, uh, in becoming, uh, in, in working alongside some of the existing volunteers that we have. And we have uh, some phenomenal volunteers, right? Many of you probably know of Pramod Varma. We call him, we tease him, we call him the royal architect, not just of India stack, but lots of uh, digital public goods that have been created. Um, we do that because he's an amazing architect and happens, uh, you know, his mother uh, used to be part of the Kerala royal family. And uh, so we tease him like that. But we have many other people like that, you know, Lalitesh Katragada, Sanjay Jain, um, you know, Vivek Raghavan, uh, many others. And uh, so these are amazing people. And uh, so many people come in because it's good to be working with some of these extremely talented people that we have. And the third is that we are uh, a tight knit group uh, with a very can do spirit uh, to take it forward. And it is the spirit of how we work, the way we get things done uh, is what kind of attracts people. So no, nobody becomes a volunteer for any one of these three reasons. It's usually a combination and the combination is different for different people. Uh, but we have learned over the last, uh, we've been in this volunteering kind of a network since 2009 and we've learned that uh, it's usually a mix of uh, one or more of these things. So this is why people, although there is no personal benefit, there is no greed and no glory, uh, people uh, still sign up to become a volunteer. And uh, then why do they stay a volunteer? You know, we have people who've been volunteering for 10 years, right? And uh, so why do they stay a volunteer? Because First and foremost, you know, volunteering is something you select what you're going to do, right? And so we encourage you to select something in which you already have an interest, which it plays to your strength. And, uh, you know, we find that if you follow this kind of a norm, then, um, then you get flow. When you're working on something, you, you actually are in that flow. And when you're in the flow, then there is joy. And, and so there is, it is fun. Uh, to volunteer. And uh, in many cases, uh, you know, we made considerable progress. Uh, so there is impact and you feel that you've been part of something uh, meaningful that has been created for India. But last uh, and not the least is self-growth. What tends to happen in our system is that you learn, uh, you know, to operate at your own limits and you find your self-limiting beliefs. And, uh, uh, and when that happens and you're able to overcome it, uh, then you get a lot of personal growth. And this personal growth is part of the reason why people are here. Now, this is a very important part of this. Uh, we, uh, we, we think that uh, this is essential for excellence in the, in the future. So we, we are living in a world where you know, it's no longer good enough to be average, right? You either are really good at what you do or it doesn't matter, right? It's uh, the winner take all phenomena is also happening to employment, right? So if you, for example, imagine for a moment that you were a marathon runner, right? And you were doing it competitively and you want to be in the top three marathon runners uh, of India. And then it is important that you develop your physical skills, which is going to, of course, play a very big role. Uh, in your running, but your, 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 uh, it is equally important for you to be calm inside, for you to be able to handle pain. And therefore you need to do inner work. If you want to be an elite athlete, uh, in uh, elite marathon, marathon runner. So 
uh, and so that inner work that you need to do uh, is uh, possible in environments which are not competitive. We call them Rang Bhumi. And these are environments like I Spirit, where you are not competing with the person, the next volunteer. You are competing with yourself and you're trying to be the best person you can be. And uh, so it develops a facet of you, uh, which does not happen in a corporate kind of an environment. And uh, what we are learning is that many of our volunteers, especially the young ones, we have a very large number of volunteers now who are what we call as under 30 volunteers. And, uh, you know, these are the people who are learning, saying that, look, if they want to really fulfill their whole potential, then it is important that they, they are able to develop themselves in a, both in a corporate kind of a setting, but also in a volunteer kind of setting, in a run bhumi, in a competitive battlefield, but also in a rang bhumi, you know, which is like a theater stage. So, <clears throat> and that combination, uh, you know, helps them be the best person they will be. So this is, you know, the reason why volunteering is so addictive and people stay uh, a volunteer as they go forward. Sid, would you like to add anything here or, uh, or should I keep going? No, Sharad, you, you can keep going. No. I, I encourage you to read our volunteer handbook. Uh, if you sign up, uh, there'll be a form later. And if you sign up uh, to become a balloon volunteer, then, uh, um, you know, uh, Pratibha will send you the volunteer handbook. But in any case, this is in the public domain. It is available. The link is marked here. And when the blog comes out, you can click on it and read it for yourself. So our volunteering process is such that you, everybody in our system uh, starts off as quote unquote, what we call as a balloon volunteer. So what we decided many years back that we don't know the shape color, size of a good volunteer. There, we don't have an archetype of a good volunteer, right? And uh, all we know is that until people try it out, they don't know it is right for themselves, right? And even if they're very convinced that volunteering is for themselves, they may find it is actually not something that works for them, you know, because you have to exert leadership in a very different way than you would do in a big company, right? And in fact, page 13 of the volunteer handbook has uh, seven rules that we have over over time learned, you know, which make it very hard for people who lived in the corporate environment to become a good volunteer. There's a lot of unlearning that is required. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, my sense is that if you really want to get more details about this, read our volunteer handbook, which itself, as you would imagine, is written by our volunteers. So it's a collaborative effort. Uh, and it will give you a sense as to how our volunteer model works. Now, volunteer for what? So, so inside iSpirit, uh, we have many volunteer teams. These teams are called rooms. And why rooms? Because we are essentially building public goods, uh, you know, for the ecosystem, right? And these goods can be of many types. They can be platforms, they can be policy, they can be market catalyst, they can be playbook. They're, you don't need to know the details. Uh, and the volunteer handbook will explain those to you. But there are many types of uh, public goods that we are creating. So where are they created? They're created inside a room. <laughs> so, so our teams are actually called rooms, right? But the other way we look at iSpirit, so iSpirit is a collection of rooms, but it is also a collection of orbit shifts. Uh, you know, iSpirit's view is that uh, bringing about delta shift and orbit shift in terms of effort costs the same. Since it costs the same effort, why should we go for delta shift? We should go for an orbit shift. So, uh, so we organize ourselves and saying, which are the orbit shifts that we are pursuing? We are pursuing many orbit shifts in iSpirit. So in today's session, we are only going to double click on two of them, uh, you know, which are very related with each other, financial inclusion and banking. And financial inclusion is the one we will talk about uh, in a little while. Uh, but there are so many others and future open house sessions we will probably, you know, double click on some of the others, you know, our work on health inclusion and health stack. Some of you may be familiar with, uh, if you go and look at 11 C, uh, you know, we've been doing some stuff on drones called the digital sky policy, you know, which is part of 11 C. So, so, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, uh, we have this notion that we want entrepreneurs, a new class of entrepreneurs to emerge. We call them panga entrepreneurs. We want disruptive entrepreneurs, you know, who will 
will uh, will not just be filling white spaces but will actually be disrupting the ecosystem so uh, uh, so so there are many things that are happening in icebit today we are only going to focus on on financial inclusion why we why banking comes alongside it because many years back we consciously took an approach that to make financial inclusion happen in india we have to take a bank led approach rather than an approach as uh, you, you know which is being taken in some of the western markets where it's a bank replace approach so in our case we don't think that is possible so we take a bank led approach so therefore that has obligations for banks and therefore you see things like upi you know while it's a very modern system and you can use phone pay and google pay and paytm but it involves a layer in the middle which is to do with the banks same is the case with lending uh, you know oken uh, open uh, credit enablement network and so on and so forth so so these two are very linked with each other and we will be talking about it in a few minutes so <clears throat> so what kind of a volunteer thrives right the kind of volunteer that thrives in our system is a builder as i said you know we are our whole mindset is that of a builder we are looking for people who will come and build right and what will they build they build either digital public platforms you know things like india stack which you know health stack and other things you know it which often include standards you know protocols apis it includes policy playbooks playbooks are things that market players use uh, it includes market rules which are then implemented by self regulating organizations and there are several new age self regulating organizations that have come up some of them you may know about for example dice.org.in focuses on upi sahamati.org.in focuses on the data account aggregator system uh, you have swast.app swast alliance that focuses on the new health uh, especially telemedicine uh, system that is coming to life you have credol that focuses on uh, the new age cash flow lending and things like that so it all involves market rules uh it involves getting investments to happen so we see narrative it involves you know public narrative we even have academic papers uh, you know very soon on i spirit site you will see something called research.ispirit.in where some of our working papers will be put out in the open domain so it's a whole of society approach that we take where we are not only uh you know supplementing state capacity but we are also supplementing market capacity so in our view you know both of these need help right now and i spirit kind of commits to uh, you know supplementing both uh, market capacity and state capacity so so this happens in the hands of builders so everybody in i spirit we want to think of themselves as a builder not as a program manager and uh, and there are certain qualities volunteer qualities that we then really care about uh the ones that are most important to us then become the last two here uh, these two modulating strengths as we call them affirmative disruptor and pragmatic idealist i'm not going to get, go through this in detail because uh, this is covered in the volunteer handbook in fact this slide is from there and uh, uh, but we you know if you are going to do orbit shift then we have to deconstruct and reconstruct right that is the orbit shift is going from one steady state to another steady state so you have to make an argument for deconstructing the current steady state because without doing that you won't solve the problem uh, and then deal with the messiness that comes and and arrive at a better st steady state and so therefore you have to disrupt but we also want you to be an affirmative disruptor which means you know your goal for disrupting is to actually build something better you know we also believe in pragmatic idealism and uh, which means pure idealist are not going to work and pure pragmatic people will not work you know for us for example gandhi was a very good example of a pragmatic idealist right and he decided maybe it's in india's interest to participate in the second world war you know on the side of the allies so uh, on the side of the british and although we were fighting the british for uh for our independence so so there is we take a similar approach because we are working in a very complex environment but for you to know you know when to be an idealist uh and when not to be an idealist is not straightforward these are not obvious answers so therefore we look for people who actually can go 
to first principles. So we really, really value first principle thinking. In our vocabulary, the first principle thinking is called Veda deliberation. Now, this has no religious connotation. We call it Veda deliberation simply because we say that, look, almost everybody, every society has people, quote unquote, you know, in the whichever religion they may be, they may be living it at the rituals level. They may be living it at a deeper level. Let's say, you know, at the Gita level or the Bible level or even deeper level at the first principles, right? You can say if you're a thousand people, maybe 990 of them are living this usually at the at the bhajan level you know you know seven eight of them are looking living at this at the gita level and two or three are living at the first principles level so we are looking for people who can get to first principles right and uh, so that's a very very important consideration for us we also look for integral thinking because remember when we unbundle and rebundle this is how unbundle the current status quo and rebundle many things so that we get to a better uh, end state, the orbit shift, uh, that requires integral thinking. Uh, our system works because many of our best volunteers are do what it takes volunteers, right? And they do whatever, they make a soft promise and they keep that promise and without having a program manager to guide it to them. And they have the ability to summon up free energy of other volunteers, right? And get them excited, interested, and, and make them go forward. So now, why, why do I share all this with you? <clears throat> you know, you must be wondering, are you suited for this or not? And as I said, we don't have an archetype. So what we do is that we let people initially try out volunteering. That trying out stage of volunteering is called balloon volunteering. Why is it called balloon volunteering? It's a very corny reason. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, I, I have a friend He's organizing a birthday party for his child. And I go to him and say, hey, can I help? And what will he say? He'll say, hey, Sharad, why don't you put a few balloons up? And in the process of putting up the few balloons, aka balloon volunteering, I get a sense of the ethos of the party, right? What is it about? And then if I like it, then I can play a more significant role next time it is happening. Maybe you know, you know, get involved in organizing things like this as I go forward. So balloon volunteering is a try and buy kind of a process uh, for ice spirit to engage with the individual for the individual to engage with ice spirit. So balloon volunteers are not yet volunteers, right? And they uh, are potential future volunteers, but that is a way for people to try it out. You pick something, try it out, you work with existing volunteers and ice spirit, and that's the way you learn whether you're cut out for <clears throat> ice spirit volunteering or not. So, so this is really uh, the background uh, that uh, we were talking about. A few words, you know, why not program managers, right? Because, uh, you know, we think a builder mindset, uh, you know, build and perhaps amplify. Both of these are very important. You know, we want, we aspire to have a system where people, if they keep their soft promises, they only they, they they make a soft promise they keep their soft promise right so we don't need third party to come in to hold their feet to the fire hey i was going to do this by thursday and then somebody comes and checks with you hey today's wednesday are you going to be ready on thursday or thursday went by today's friday hey did you finish it you know we don't have those people in ice spirit at all so we need self driven people who have the ability to and the self-discipline to keep their own soft promises. Second, we want people who will move the needle forward. So they are builders of some kind or the other. So that's really a little bit about uh, what kind of volunteers do we need. So with that, uh, I am going to request uh, Sid to flash his slides. Uh, and Sid is going to take over from this point onwards. Sid, if you like, I can keep running the slides. You let me know whichever works for you. I'll, I'll switch, Sharad. It might just make it easier. Uh, Yeah, are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. So building on what Sharad outlined, uh, and, and really what we're going to share with you today is a set of balloon volunteering uh, challenges uh, within the financial inclusion space that iSpirit is looking at. As you know, within financial inclusion, we've taken a long-term view essentially to democratize credit for the individuals and small businesses in this country. Uh, 
right? And most individuals don't have access to credit. And same is the case, you know, eight to 10% of small businesses only have formal financing. And therefore, we have been working for the past, you know, almost 10 years towards building out the right set of digital public infrastructure so that various private innovators can build on top of this and create new financial products. You may have seen in a couple of India Stack presentations or heard of Rajni, right? So Rajni is a street vendor. It's what all of the volunteers, a large number of volunteers within the financial inclusion uh, space of iSpirit are working for. So Rajni is a vegetable vendor. You can imagine seeing her at any of the informal markets, right? And she often come in the morning, uh, you whenever the goods, the vegetables come into that market, you'd often see informal money lenders standing to the side of that truck, right? So Rajni will go to them, take out a loan. Uh, it's a daily loan, often at interest rates of one to two, in some cases, even 4% per day, which when you annualize is exorbitant, right? And then Rajni would purchase the goods, set up her shop, sell it, and then return the loan at the end of the day. So the question for us was really, how do we create a system that formally includes Rajni, that allows for private players to, you know, distribute credit uh, in a safe, efficient, low cost manner. And to do that, it required the laying of a set of digital public infrastructure. It of course started off with Aadhaar so that using Aadhaar, Rajni could prove her identity and uh, use that to open up a bank account. She then of course needed a way to make transactions because it's only on the back of transactions that um, uh, an underwriting decision could be possible, right? And since at that point in time, if you look three to four years back, um, the only available payment system was Visa and MasterCard. And, you know, Visa MasterCard would take 1% on each leg. So therefore, you know, the 2% instead of going to the informal money lender is now going to Visa MasterCard and the interest rates don't work out. And that's when we took a first principles view of designing a mass market payment system in India on the back of Rajni's smartphone, which is now what's known as UPI. UPI has therefore allowed Rajni to not only receive uh, money digitally from her customers, but also creates the ability using e-mandates and other functionality to pay back her lender when she takes a loan. And now because she has the ability to receive these payments digitally, these are therefore getting logged against her bank account, right? So she's building up a digital transactional trail, at which point she therefore needs the ability to share this information with the lender, right? And as you know, today data sharing is completely broken. Rajni would either, you know, go to her bank branch and try to take a printout. And in many cases, you know, even losing a day's work is very difficult. Uh, or, you know, she'll digitally run around to different portals, downloading PDFs and trying to upload those PDFs or scan copies to a lender, right? So it's, a, it's an extremely broken system. And that's why the entire consent layer of India Stack, or what's now called the Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture, of which the account aggregator, as many of you would know, uh, is a manifestation of that for financial data. So at a click of a button, Rajni can now fetch her financial information and in a safe, secure manner, share that with her lender. And of course, lenders, now that they receive this high provenance, trustworthy data, can return multiple offers back to Rajni, right? Because she should have agency and she should have the ability to choose between different lenders on the back of her smartphone and not have to, you know, physically run around to multiple lenders. And that's where the whole open credit enablement network comes in or OKIN as it's commonly known, because using Okin in real time, lenders can now return back offers to Rajni. Rajni has the ability to select the best offer, right? And then she needs the ability to sign that loan agreement. And as a result, uh, e-sign was created so that Rajni could digitally sign it. And that's legally valid in a court of law. Otherwise, you'd have to physically send someone from the bank branch. Uh, the, you know, it's going to cost you 1,500 to 2,000 rupees and uh, to go take the paperwork to Rajni, get her to sign it, take the paperwork back. And uh, uh, therefore the ticket size of the loan just won't work out. And now that Rajni could digitally sign it, she needed a safe, secure way to store those documents. And that's the reason why we created DigiLocker. 
So as you see, a range of this public infrastructure has been built out on top of which multiple private innovators have come out, like Sharad mentioned, on, in the UPI space, phone pay, Google pay, Paytm, WhatsApp pay, within the account aggregator space, a range of companies uh, uh, across lenders, wealth managers, the account aggregators themselves. And what I'm now going to share with you is, you know, specific problems within the ecosystem uh, uh, that have, you know, come up and that's areas where we see, you know, as we move further and further along these cash flow lending efforts, uh, um, uh, there are some, you know, we see this digital infrastructure being key to take us to the next level. So to start off with, uh, the first class of problem is, is what I've called as the underwriting models for cash flow lending. So if you take a look at most lending in this country, right, it actually happens on the back of underwriting an entity or on, you know, underwriting a project. As you know, most project finance is, has, has failed, right? And that's partially the reason for the crisis within the banking system. And even when most of the banks, you know, take a look at, you know, maybe if you look at the portfolio of India's largest private sector banks, 75% of their MSME portfolio is uh, on the back of collateral, right? Physical collateral. And so even in cases where they underwrite an entity, it's oftentimes very basic, very primitive underwriting that takes place because really they've got, you know, for that loan value, they've got a higher value physical collateral attached to that, right? And so therefore we need to shift the ecosystem. If you want to make cash flow lending successful, we need to shift the ecosystem from underwriting an entity towards underwriting a business transaction. Let's say, you know, if I split up my cash flow into a set of invoices, a set of receivables, right? Can a lender assess the risk of a particular invoice, right? So for a moment, if you look at it, let's say, you know, every month I raise 10 invoices that my buyers are going to pay against, right? And maybe three of those 10 invoices are to highly rated buyers. You know, another three invoices have a recurring, these are non-rated buyers, non-rated MSMEs, but there is a recurring relationship with them, right? And you can see that recurring relationship in my GST data, as well as in my bank account statement. Uh, and then there might be, let's say, another three or four invoices that are one time in nature, right? And probably um, uh, to non-rated buyers and, you know, maybe even the amounts vary. So therefore, lenders now have the ability to pick the best parts of the cash flow which would be, let's say, the first three invoices that are to a rated buyer and the three that have a recurring relationship and underwrite those transactions. You can imagine the same in a purchase order context and, of course, extend this to individuals as well. But therefore, to move lenders from the current, you know, very primitive rule-based system they have uh, towards a system that's able to analyze the data that's coming in from GST, from account aggregator, uh, account aggregators bringing in not just banking, but data across other sectors like telecom as well, which is often useful for new to credit customers. Uh, it's, it's important that a set of, you know, reference underwriting models get created. And so therefore we're looking for a volunteer that can help us think this through, right? Who's, who, who gets excited by immersing themselves in these different types of data, data structures, uh, identifying patterns across, you know, not just, because if you look at it, there are two types of data you'd receive now as a lender. One is, of course, personal data about that borrower with consent, but you also have the ability to receive anonymized data, which is what the whole non-personal data framework that, uh, and the report that came out by the Chris Gopala Krishnan Committee is looking at, right? And that anonymized information highlights a lot of networked patterns, right? And so you can now plot where this individual, where this business fits on a larger curve of businesses, say even within that region, right? And the third category of data, so you have personal data, you have anonymous data sets coming out, and then you even have various open data sets, right? So you can possibly combine satellite imagery and a whole bunch of, you know, census and other information uh, that tells you, let's say, economic activity in a region. And so now if you receive a loan application for a Kirana store via an LSP like, say, Khata Books, you now have the ability to say, you know, is the cash flow of this particular Kirana store um, really, you know, where does it fit on the curve of cash flows in that region, right? So you now have the ability to micro segment uh, these different cash flows, both of an individual or of a small business. And therefore, if someone's really excited about 
immersing themselves in these data structures, as I said, understanding patterns across this, right? And working with the lenders in the ecosystem to make this transition, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. So Sid, may I add, so essentially we are trying to bring about an orbit shift in the quality of underwriting models that are used by the lenders. Uh, now, you know, this is really supplementing market capacity. And how are we supplementing market capacity? By creating reasonably good quality reference underwriting models as a public good. So because that then becomes the floor, right? Then people compete by building something better than that. But they quickly go from almost nothing to something actually quite good uh, and then build forward from there. So this is really our way of influencing the ecosystem you know, bringing the orbit shift about. So we're going to build this underwriting models and give them away, put them in the public domain. And hopefully then market players will move faster than would have been the case if they were left completely to their own devices. So back to you, Sid. Thanks, thanks, Sharad. Absolutely. In fact, you know, by building these reference implementations that accelerates what otherwise would have taken, you know, maybe 10 years or 15 years for these market players, or in some cases, they wouldn't even achieve that. The second uh, class of challenges is around the open credit and enablement network. So while, it, you know, broadly, a lot of you on the call may be familiar with Okin. Uh, essentially, it allows, it acts as a bridge between uh, borrowers, potential borrowers that may be on a marketplace. Let's see, Swiggy, Zomato, GST, uh, GEMS, the government e-marketplace, uh, Kata Books, OK Credit, and so on. And then lenders on the other end. So marketplaces that have low cost of customer acquisition, lenders that have low cost of capital, Okin bridges the two to bring real-time cash flow lending to life. And most of the nation's top lenders have implemented these open APIs. So just like you know, account aggregator is an open API for data, UPI is an open API for payments, Okin is an open API for cash flow credit. Now, as you double click into the workings of Okin, you'll notice that it brings together almost, you know, over eight different types of entities. So it not only brings together the lender, but on the back end, there is the credit bureau, there'll be derived data providers, there's the account aggregator, there are digital payment players like uh, the, your UPI players for e-mandates to facilitate collections. Uh, there is also various tech partners that enable these different systems to comply with these APIs and so on. And therefore, for a successful transaction, for a successful credit transaction, uh, you need every single player to be highly available and performant because this credit transaction is also happening in real time, right? So as a borrower, I should have the ability to register on any Okin enabled marketplace, share my information, and lenders return back offers in real time, select the best offer for me, and I receive that disbursement in real time. So on the back end, multiple parties have to come together to facilitate the successful transaction, right? And each of them, you know, govern differently, the large companies on their own, right? And therefore, if anyone's really keen, right, that's really interested in building out highly resilient, highly performant systems, right, at an ecosystem level, uh, then this. Uh, 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 then this challenge might be of interest to you, right? Because it's about not just bringing about high availability within the specific OKEN implementation that say a marketplace may do, but across all the interconnects that are happening to facilitate that one transaction. The third kind of challenge essentially relates to preventing double financing in the system. Right. So as these are real time transactions, as you know, credit bureaus, the reporting is, you know, in some cases, 30 days, but goes up to three months. Right. And so how do you ensure that if a borrower is financed for, let's say, his purchase order, the same borrower is not financed for his invoice. If the borrower is financed for his invoice on one marketplace, that same invoice is not financed, you know, on any other marketplace. How do you ensure if the borrower is financed, you know, in, in real time, the borrower obtains financing from a lender today. Tomorrow, when he goes to another lender to apply for a loan, his credit exposure reflects the credit he got yesterday as well and does not reflect you know, credit exposure that's 30 days old or three months old, right? Because if it does, then you are going to have 
uh, uh, double financing take place and that's going to result in the borrowers going into over indebtedness. So if there's anyone that's interested in thinking through what the construct of this real time pledge, pledge registry would look like, then please do reach out. You know, we should mention here that uh, iSprit has built many big registries. Aadhaar is a resident registry in the health tax facility registry, doctor registry are already rolling out and there are many other registries in the middle. So, so you know, so you'll get to become really cutting edge at building world class, uh, you know, population scale registries. So, so this is, uh, you know, factor that in when you think about this challenge. Thanks, Sharad. Uh, the, the fourth one is essentially, you know, if you put yourself in the lender's shoes again, and what we are attempting to do is, and COVID has really heightened it, right? And therefore, the only way out of this economic crisis for a lot of MSMEs is if we can bridge the gap from what otherwise they would have taken four or five years to come back to uh, their current equilibrium position, could that be accelerated to, you know, two, two and a half years? If that needs to happen, cash flow credit becomes very key. But that means the lenders need to have, you know, the, 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 the right framework in place to even allocate capital towards cash flow lending uh, within their own institution, right? So if you put yourself into a lender's shoes, um, a lot of questions arise when you think about capital allocation, right? Firstly, you know, if you, firstly, if you take a portfolio perspective, you know, what are the set of LSPs I should engage with depending on the capital that I have raised? you know, often certain portfolio requirements come in. So what are the minimum set of LSPs that I must engage with? Engage with? Then within the LSP itself, you know, what are the borrower profiles that I should or shouldn't lend to, right? Which are the borrower profiles that I should lend to right at the start? Maybe borrowers uh, uh, that are, have maybe, if you're doing invoice financing, then more trustworthy invoices because say they're backed by a government agency or PSU on GEMS. And then second is borrowers that have a recurring relationship. Right. Um, so thinking through what are the portfolio borrowers within an LSP that you start lending to. Then third is even on your, the, the, the lenders liability side, right. As they raise capital, how should they think about raising capital when this capital is going to be deployed towards these non-rated MSMEs. Right. And uh, so on. So if there is anyone that's interested in thinking through that construct, uh, then, then please do reach out because essentially the old way that lenders would approach this, which is, you know, start off extremely small, very primitive rule-based model, and then let's learn along the way. Uh, that's going to take five years to mature. And so if we can accelerate that to 2.5, uh, then that has a significant benefit to the MSMEs in the country. The fifth uh, class of problem. Uh, it's similar to, in some sense, the problem of resilience, resiliency or high performance across the multiple parties is dispute resolution, right? So like I said, for a single successful credit transaction to get fulfilled, you know, that transaction goes to multiple parties. It's the lender, it's a credit bureau, it's the account aggregator, it's a UPIE mandates player, it's, you know, the tech partners that have enabled this and so on. And therefore, issues can arise at any one of these ends, right? Let's say you you attempt to apply for a loan, but you get stuck with your account aggregator because the data flow is stuck. Now, the data flow is stuck could be because either the account aggregator has an issue or the financial information provider that's connected to an account aggregator has an issue, which is from where you're sharing your information. Or the FIU itself, the financial information user, the lender has an issue. Right. And if you double click on even the FIU, then, you know, is it an issue in the lender system, the tech partner system? Right. And this is just one part of the chain that I've unbundled and laid out for you. You can imagine the same in the UPI ecosystem as well, where let's say I'm authorizing an e-mandate for collections and that authorization fails. Right. And so therefore, where is the issue taking place? Is it an issue with my bank? Is it an issue with the sponsor app? Is it an issue with you know, the PSP server, NPCI, multiple parties within this chain as well. So as you kind of unbundle each of these chains, you notice that multiple parties are involved. The transaction could get stuck for various reasons at each of these legs, 
right? And therefore the consumer gets stuck in that journey. And so how should dispute resolution take place? How should the two entities, one in a you know, B2B manner, resolve these disputes? And can they also proactively be identified beforehand? Before, you know, let's say, for going back to my account aggregator example, let's say instead of the transaction failing, if proactively I was able to monitor that, let's say a particular FIP was down, then I could inform the consumer that, hey, your FIP is down and therefore you won't be able to make this transaction at this point in time, right? So there's one part of proactively identifying these issues and then either informing the customer or informing the concerned B2B entity. In that case, it would be the account aggregator informing the FIP directly and working with them to get it up, right? And the second is post factor, which is in case you've not been able to proactively identify that, then how do these disputes and grievances get resolved? Right. Let's say, for example, the customer's applied for the loan. He's approved the loan agreement. His bureau has been updated saying he's got the loan, but the disbursement never arrives. Then what happens? Right. So we need someone who's going to help think through across these multiple parties uh, dispute resolution for the consumer. The next class of challenge is essentially around creating an economic framework for the various digital public infrastructure building blocks that are a part of the India stack, right? So how do you design incentive aligned business models? So if you look at the whole data empowerment playground, right, where you have these new class of entities called consent managers and account aggregators are a manifestation of them for financial data. And you'll have consent managers for health and consent managers for telecom and various other education and skills, right? What would be an incentive aligned business model for them so that you don't end up with an ecosystem filled with rogue intermediaries, right? And, and the financial sector today is rife with that. If you take a look at the rating agencies on one end, rating agencies essentially have a misaligned incentive model, right? Essentially what, what happens is the uh, uh, rating agencies are working for the issuers of the bond rather than buyers of the bond, which are end consumers like me or other end uh, uh, and uh, entities that purchase bonds, right? You see the same happening with credit bureaus today, right? Very incentive misaligned uh, business models. So within the financial sector, it's been filled with, you know, these rogue intermediaries that have been created. And as some of these new institutions come up, whether it's in the payment space or in the data empowerment playground, it's critical that their business model, just like their technology is incentive aligned, it's interoperable. The business models are, uh, of course, you know, successful so that they can grow and go deeper and deeper into the market and, and further bring about uh, deeper financial inclusion. But at the same time, it's also incentive aligned where these, the economic incentives of the company are really aligned with the best outcome for that individual, right? So if anyone's interested in thinking through this, uh, again, please do reach out. And, and the last class of challenge is essentially around bringing about a paperless and presentless experience for legal entities in India, right? So as you know, the India stack has solved this for individuals uh, through Aadhaar, through eKYC and eSign. Right, so you now have the ability for an individual to do a digital KYC and digital signatures on their smartphone. And as you extend this to the world of legal entities, let's say I'm a sole proprietor, then how can I digitally do my KYC? And how can I digitally authorize a transaction? Like let's say signing of a loan agreement. If you take the example of let's say a private limited company, if a private limited company had to do a KYC, which involves, you know, doing a KYC of the directors and of the company itself, how do you establish genuineness um, of a business entity digitally, right? And let's say you do establish genuineness of a business entity. And so you're able to complete this KYC. Then how does the authorization of a loan agreement take place? Because when you authorize a loan agreement, you want to ensure that you, as a lender, if I receive a signed loan agreement, I want to ensure that firstly, 
you know, who are all the directors within the company and is this particular director authorized to sign this loan agreement? Today, that authorization chain is digitally not available anywhere, right? And the same problem extends sole proprietorships. It's slightly easier class of problem because it's a it's a one-to-one -one mapping with the proprietor, but the same problem extends even for partnerships because you've got the various partners and then you've got the partnership itself. And so therefore, if you're interested in bringing about this trans paperless and presentless transformation for legal entities, uh, uh, then, and this is a challenge that interests you, then, then please do reach out to us. And you can reach out to us by filling out this form. Uh, it's available on bit.ly slash iSpirit form. Um, it's fairly simple. And uh, if any of the challenges that I've shared with you, whichever one interests you the most, then please mention that in the form itself. And Pratiba, uh, who's one of the iSpirit volunteers, will connect with you. Uh, she'll also uh, share with you and, and have you go through the volunteer handbook, some of which Sharad described in the earlier part of this call, as also the, and also the Playgrounds Coda. And the Playgrounds Coda essentially outlines how iSpirit works with different players in the ecosystem. And if you have any questions, Pratiba would be happy to help you out and answer those. And also to see that you've absorbed this information and uh, you have an understanding of the iSpirit volunteer hand model, as well as the way iSpirit works with different players in the ecosystem, we'll have you go through a fairly uh, simple knowledge quiz, right? And then on the back of that, we'll connect you to each of these challenges that I outlined have different anchor volunteers attached to them, right? And so we'll have you connected to those anchor volunteers as a balloon volunteer and they'll be happy to discuss with you further details on the nuances of the problem, the challenges, various bounds of that problem, and then you know how could one go about solving for it. And then we can you know, have a final discussion on whether this makes sense, you want to step in to help out, or hey, maybe this isn't the right environment, but if it is the right environment for you, then you can get started. And, and this takes time. I mean, balloon volunteering itself you know, what we've outlined, this is just a small part of the getting started journey, which is going to take you a few weeks. And in some cases, you know, the the journey from a balloon volunteer to a volunteer takes months and, you know, six months, some cases over a, more than a year as well. Right. But these are extremely interesting challenges and really look forward uh, to connecting with any of you that, that are interested in solving for these. Pratiba, Sharad, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, in conclusion, uh, I would say that, look, as you can see, uh, iSpirit is about big things, but ultimately it is also about very important things. We tend to, we like to think of ourselves, you know, as operating both at the 30,000 feet level, but also at the three centimeter level. And our ability to take a systems view and solve it properly all across is what builds successful Kind of outcomes. So that is number one. Second, it is intellectually intense. You know, we have this mindset that whatever we do should be world class. So intellectually, it is intense. And finally, it brings the energy of a startup to building the ecosystem. So our energy within iSpirit is just like a startup, except we're not doing it for ourselves, not to make money but to actually have a better playground or a better ecosystem and a better India. So this is really how uh, iSpirit is. And uh, if this is of interest and you want to reach out, we want to you know, streamline our process of balloon volunteering so that anybody, even if you don't know anybody in iSpirit, uh, you can reach out uh, through this form. In the past, you needed to know somebody to become a balloon volunteer. So we are kind of opening up our process so that uh, you know, many of you uh, who have expressed an interest uh, find it easier to connect with us and move forward. So with that, a uh, very big thank you uh, for participating in this and keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.